Section 5 of The Most Extraordinary Trial of William Palmer by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Third day, May the 16th. The court was quite as full at the commencement of the proceedings this morning as it had been on either of the preceding days. The Earl of Derby, Earl Grey, and other noble lords were again present. The jury took their seats shortly before ten o'clock. The learned judges, Lord Chief Justice Campbell, Mr. Baron Alderson, and Mr. Justice Cresswell, soon afterwards entered the court, accompanied by the recorder and sheriffs, and the prisoner was then placed at the bar. He appeared rather more anxious than on the two previous days, but was still calm and collected, and paid the greatest attention to the evidence. Counsel for the Crown. The Attorney General, Mr. E. James, Q.C., Mr. Bodkin, Mr. Wellesby, and Mr. Huddleston. For the prisoner, Mr. Sergeant Shee, Mr. Grove, Q.C., Mr. Gray, and Mr. Keneally. The next witness for the prosecution was Charles Joseph Roberts, examined by Mr. E. James. In November last I was apprentice to Mr. Hawkins, a druggist, at Rugeley. I know Palmer. On Tuesday, November the 20th, between 11 and 12 in the day, he came into Mr. Hawkins's shop. He first asked for two drachms of prussic acid, for which he had brought a bottle. I was putting it up when Newton, the assistant of salt, came in. Palmer told him he wanted to speak to him, and they went out of the shop together. I then saw Brassington, the cooper, take Newton away from Palmer, and enter into conversation with him. Palmer then came back into the shop, and asked me for six grains of strychnine and two drachms of Batley's solution of opium, commonly called Batley's sedative. I had put up the prussic acid, which was lying upon the counter. He stood at the counter when he ordered the things, and while I was preparing them behind the counter, he stood at the shop door, with his back to me, looking into the street. I was about five minutes preparing them. He stood at the door till they were ready, when I delivered them to him. The prussic acid in the bottle he had brought, the strychnine in a paper, and the opium in a bottle. He paid me for them and took them away. No one else was in the shop from the time when Palmer and Newton went out, till I delivered the things to him. When Palmer had left, Newton came in, and we had some conversation. I had at that time been six years in Mr. Hawkins's employment. Palmer had not bought any drugs at the shop for about two years. I know Thirlby, Palmer's assistant. He had started a shop about two years before. By Lord Campbell. Thirlby was carrying on business as a druggist at the time. Cross-examined by Mr. Sergeant Shee. I did not make entries of any of these things in the books re-examined when articles are paid for across the counter i am not in the habit of making entries of them in the books the attorney-general stated that dr bamford was seriously ill and unable to attend but his depositions would be read mr william stevens examined by the attorney-general i have been a merchant in the city but am now out of business was stepfather to the deceased mr cook I married his father's widow fifteen or eighteen years ago, and have known him intimately ever since. I was made executor to his grandfather's will. I was always on friendly terms with him, and constantly had the care of him. He had property worth altogether about twelve thousand pounds. He was articled to a solicitor at Worthing, in Sussex, but he did not follow the profession. He had been connected with the turf about three or four years perhaps not so much i did everything in my power to withdraw him from that pursuit lord campbell but you still remained on friendly terms witness on affectionate terms the last time i saw him alive was at the station at euston square about two o'clock on the afternoon of the fifth of november i think he told me he was going to rugeley but i am not quite sure he looked better than i had seen him for a very long time I was so gratified that I said, "'My boy, you look very well now. You don't look anything of an invalid.' 
he said he was quite well and struck himself on the chest i think he added he would be quite right if he was happy in point of appearance he was not a robust man his complexion was pale during the previous winter he had had a sore throat for some months i first heard of his death on the evening of wednesday november the twenty first mr jones of lutterworth called at my house and informed me of it the next day i went down to lutterworth with mr jones for the purpose of searching for the will and papers the day after i went to rugeley i arrived between twelve and one i asked to see the body when i got to the inn i met palmer in the passage i had seen him once before and mr jones introduced me to him he followed us upstairs to see the body and removed the sheet from it to rather below the waist i was much struck with its appearance i first noticed the tightness of the muscles across the face there did not appear to me to be any emaciation or disease we all went downstairs to one of the sitting-rooms in a short time i said to palmer i hear from mr jones that you know something of my son's affairs can you tell me anything about them he replied yes there are four thousand pounds worth of bills out of his and i am sorry to say my name is to them but i have got a paper drawn up by a lawyer and signed by him to show that i never had any money from them i expressed great surprise at this and said i fear there won't be four thousand shillings to pay you but i asked had he no horses no property palmer replied yes he has some horses but they are mortgaged i said has he no sporting bets nor anything of that sort he mentioned one debt of three hundred pounds i would rather not state the name of the person who owed it it is a relation of his not a sporting gentleman the witness wrote down the name and handed it to the counsel on both sides and the judges lord campbell the name is immaterial palmer said he did not know of any other debt i said i thought his sporting creditors would have to take his sporting effects as i should have nothing to do with them i added well whether he has left anything or not poor fellow he must be buried palmer immediately said oh i'll bury him myself if that's all i said i certainly can't think of your doing that i shall do it cook's brother-in-law who had come to meet me was then present and expressed a great wish to bury him i said no as his executor i shall take care of that i cannot have the funeral immediately as i intend to bury him in london in his mother's grave i shall be sorry to inconvenience the people here at the inn but i will get it done as soon as possible palmer said oh that's of no consequence but the body ought to be fastened up at once he repeated that observation so long as the body is fastened up it is of no consequence while i was talking to cook's brother-in-law palmer and jones left the room they returned in about half an hour i then asked palmer for the name of some respectable undertaker in rugeley that i might at once order a coffin and give directions he said i have been and done that i have ordered a shell and strong oak coffin i expressed my surprise i said i did not give you any authority to do so but i must see the undertaker to let him have my instructions i think he told me the name of the undertaker i ordered dinner for myself my son-in-law and jones and i asked palmer to come in we all dined together at the inn about three i was going back to london that afternoon after dinner palmer being still present i desired mr jones to be so good as to go upstairs and get me mr cook's betting book or pocket book or books or papers that might be there i had seen him with a betting book a small one with clasps mr jones then left the room and palmer followed him they were away ten minutes mr jones said on their return i am very sorry to say i can't find any betting book or papers i exclaimed no betting book mr jones turning towards palmer i said how is this palmer said oh it is of no manner of use if you find it i said no use sir i am the best judge of that he replied it is of no use i said i am told it is of use i understand my son won a great deal of money at shrewsbury 
and I ought to know something about it. He replied, It is of no use, I assure you. When a man dies, his bets are done with. Besides, Cook received the greater part of his money on the course at Shrewsbury. I said, Very well, the book ought to be found, and must be found. Palmer then said, in a quieter tone, It will no doubt be found. I again said, Sir, it shall be found. I then went to the door, and calling to the housekeeper, I desired that everything in the bedroom should be locked up, and nothing touched until I returned or sent someone. Before leaving, I went upstairs to take a last look at the body. Some servants were in the room, turning over the bedclothes, and also the undertaker. I had given him instructions before dinner to place the body in the coffin. He was standing by the side of the shell. The body was in it, uncovered. I knelt down by the side of the shell, and taking the right hand of the corpse, I found it clinched. I looked across the body and saw that the left hand was clinched in the same manner. I returned to town and communicated next morning with my solicitor, who gave me a letter to Mr. Gardner of Rugeley. I returned to Rugeley where I arrived at eight o'clock next evening, Saturday. I started from Euston Square at two o'clock, and on the platform I met Palmer. He said he had received a telegraphic message summoning him to London after I had left Rugeley. I asked him where Cook's horses were kept. He told me at Eddisford, near Rugeley, and said he would drive me out there if I wished. When I got to Wolverton, where the train stops, I saw him again in the refreshment room. I said, Mr. Palmer, this is a very melancholy thing, the death of my poor son happening so suddenly. I think for the sake of his brother and sister, who are somewhat delicate, it might be desirable for his medical friends to know what his complaints were. Cook had a sister and half-brother. Palmer replied, That can be done very well. The bell then rang, and we went to our seats. He travelled in a different carriage till we reached Rugby, where I saw him again in the refreshment room. I said, Mr. Palmer, as I live at a distance, I think I ought to ask a solicitor at Rugeley to look after my interest. He said, Oh, yes, you might do that. Do you know any solicitor? I said, No. I then got some refreshment and went back to my carriage. I found Palmer sitting there. I had no conversation with him before we reached Rugeley, but continued talking to a lady and gentleman with whom I had been conversing since I left town. After we arrived at Rugeley, Palmer said, Do you know any solicitor here? I said, No, I don't. I am a perfect stranger. He said, I know them all intimately, and I can introduce you to one. When I get home, I must have a cup of coffee, and I will then come over and take you all about. I thanked him, as I had done once or twice before, and said I wouldn't trouble him. He repeated his offer. Altering my tone and manner, I said, Mr. Palmer, if I should call in a solicitor to give me advice, I suppose you will have no objection to answer any question he may put to you. I altered my tone purposely. I looked steadily at him, but although the moon was shining, I could not see his features distinctly. He said, with a spasmodic convulsion of the throat, which was perfectly apparent, Oh, no, certainly not. At Wolverton, I had purposely mentioned my desire that there should be a post-mortem examination, and I ought to say that he was quite calm when I mentioned it. After I asked him that question, there was a pause for three or four minutes. He then again proposed to come over to me after he had had his coffee, and I again begged he would not trouble himself. I went to Mr. Gardner and then came back to the inn. Palmer came to me and began to talk about the bills. He said, It's a very unpleasant affair for me. I said, I think it right to tell you that since I saw you I have had rather a different account of Mr. Cook's affairs. He said, Oh, indeed. I hope, at any rate, they will be settled pleasantly. I said, His affairs can only be settled in a court of chancery. He asked me what friends Mr. Cook visited in the neighbourhood of London. I said, Several. The next day, Sunday, I saw him again between five and six in the evening. 
He said, You were talking of going to Eddisford. If I were you, I would not take a solicitor with me there. I said, Why not? I shall use my own judgment. Later in the evening he came again to my room, holding a piece of paper, as if he wished to give it to me. I went on with my writing, and said, "'Pray, who is Mr. Smith?' He repeated, "'Mr. Smith?' two or three times, and I said, "'I mean a Mr. Smith who sat up with my son one night.' He said, "'He is a solicitor in the town.' I asked if he was in practice. He replied, "'Yes.' I said, I ask you the question because, as the betting book is lost, I should wish to know who has been with the young man. After a pause, I said, did you attend my son in a medical capacity? He said, oh dear, no. I said, I ask you because I am determined to have his body examined, and if you had attended him professionally, I suppose the gentleman I shall call in would think it proper that you should be present. He asked who was to perform the examination. I said, I cannot say. I shall not know myself until to-morrow. I think it right to tell you of it, but whether you are present at it or not is a matter of indifference to me. Did you perceive any sign of decomposition in the body, or anything which would render its immediate enclosure necessary? On the contrary, the body did not look to me like a dead body. I was surprised at its appearance. Cross-examined by Mr. Sergeant Shee the last time cook stayed at my house was in january or february last year for about a month he then had a sore throat i do not remember that it was continually sore he had not the least difficulty in swallowing i did not notice any ulcers about his face in the spring he complained of being an invalid and said his medical friends told him that if he was not better in the winter he ought to go to a warm climate no communication was made to me about insuring his life i was dissatisfied about the loss of the betting book i desired that everything belonging to the deceased might be locked up when i returned to rugeley with palmer i went to seek for mr gardiner i saw him on the following sunday morning i have once been in communication with the police officer field that was a fortnight or three weeks after my son's death field called upon me i never applied to him by mr baron alderson i never called upon mr bamford but he dined with me at the talbot arms mary keeley examined by mr wellsby i am a widow living at rugeley on the morning of wednesday the twenty first of november last i was sent for to lay out cook's body my sister-in-law went with me that was about one o'clock in the morning. The body was still warm, but the hands and arms were cold. The body was lying on the back. The arms were crossed upon the chest. The head lay a little turned on one side. The body was very stiff indeed. I have laid out many corpses. I never saw one so stiff before. We had difficulty in straightening the arms. We could not keep them straight down to the body. I passed a piece of tape under the back and tied it round the wrists to fasten the arms down. The right foot turned on one side, outwards. We were obliged to tie both the feet together. The eyes were open. We were a considerable time before we could close them, because the eyelids were very stiff. The hands were closed and were very stiff. Palmer was upstairs with us. He lighted me while I took two rings off Cook's fingers. That was off one hand. The fingers were very stiff, and I had difficulty in getting off the rings. I got them off, and when I had done so, the hand closed again. I did not see anything of a betting book, nor any small book like a pocket book. Cross-examined by Mr. Grove. It is not unusual to tie the hands of a corpse. I have never before used tape to tie the arms. I have used it to tie the ankles together, and also for the toes. I have never seen it used for the arms. It is usual to lay the arms by the sides. If the body gets stiff, the arms remain as they were at the time of death. If the eyes are closed at the time of death, there is no difficulty in keeping them closed. It is a common thing to put penny pieces upon them to keep them closed. That is to prevent the eyelid drawing back. 
the jaw is generally tied up shortly after death re-examined by the attorney-general i cannot say how many bodies i have laid out but i have laid out a great many of all ages i never knew of the arms being tied before this instance it is usual to lay the arms by the sides within a few minutes after death i was called up at half past twelve it was half past one when i went upstairs to the room where cook lay sometimes the feet of corpses get twisted out it is then that they are tied that occurs within about half an hour after death i have never known the eyelid so stiff as in this case i have put penny pieces on the eyes in those cases the lids were stiff but not so stiff as in this instance john thomas harland examined by mr bodkin i am a physician residing at stafford on the twenty sixth of november last i went from stafford to rugeley to be present at a post-mortem examination i arrived at rugeley at ten o'clock in the morning i called at the house of mr bamford surgeon as i went there palmer joined me in the street he came from the back of his own house i had frequently seen him and had spoken to him before he said i am glad that you are come to make a post-mortem examination some one might have been sent whom i did not know i said what is this case i hear there is a suspicion of poisoning he said oh no i think not he had an epileptic fit on monday and tuesday last and you will find old disease in the heart and in the head we then went together to mr bamford's i had brought no instruments with me having only been requested to be present at the examination palmer said that he had instruments and offered to fetch them and lend them to me he palmer said there was a very queer old man who seemed to suspect him of something but he did not know what he meant or what he wanted he also said he seems to suspect that i have got the betting book cook had no betting book that would be of use to any one mr bamford and i then went to the house of mr freer who is a surgeon at rugeley palmer did not go with us thence we went to the talbot arms where the post-mortem examination was proceeded with mr devonshire operated and mr newton assisted him there were in the room besides mr bamford palmer myself and several other persons i stood near mr devonshire the body was very stiff by lord campbell it was much stiffer than bodies usually are five or six days after death examination resumed the muscles were very highly developed by that i mean that they were strongly contracted and thrown out i examined the hands they were stiff and were firmly closed the abdominal viscera were first examined at the suggestion of lord campbell the witness read a report which he prepared on the day on which this post-mortem examination took place november the twenty sixth eighteen fifty five and transmitted to mr stevens the stepfather of the deceased this report described the state of the various internal organs as being perfectly healthy and natural the material statements were all repeated in the subsequent examination of the witness after reading the report the witness continued the abdominal viscera were in a perfectly healthy state they were taken out of the body we examined the liver it was healthy the lungs were healthy but contained a good deal of blood not more than would be accounted for by gravitation after death we examined the head the brain was quite healthy there was no extravasation of blood and no serum there was nothing which in my judgment could cause pressure the heart was contracted and contained no blood that was the result not of disease but of spasmodic action at the larger end of the stomach there were numerous small yellowish white spots about the size of mustard seeds they would not at all account for death i doubt whether they would have any effect upon the health i think they were mucus follicles the kidneys were full of blood which had gravitated there they had no appearance of disease the blood was in a fluid state that is not usual it is found so in some cases of sudden death which are of rare occurrence 
the lower part of the spinal cord was not very closely examined we examined the other part of that cord it presented a perfectly natural appearance on a subsequent day i think the twenty fifth of january it was thought right to exhume the body that the spinal cord might be more carefully examined i was present at that examination the lower part of the spinal cord was then minutely examined a report was made of that examination this report was put in and was read by the witness it described minutely the appearance and condition of the spinal cord and its envelopes and concluded with this statement there is nothing in the condition of the spinal cord or its envelopes to account for death nothing but the most normal and healthy state allowance being made for the lapse of time since the death of the deceased examination resumed i am still of opinion that there was nothing in the appearance of the spine to account for the death of the deceased and nothing of an unusual kind which might not be referred to changes after death when the stomach and the intestines were removed from the body on the occasion of the first examination they were separately emptied into a jar and were afterwards placed in it mr devonshire and mr newton removed them from the body they were the only two who operated at that time the prisoner was standing on the right of mr newton while mr devonshire was opening the stomach a push was given by palmer which sent mr newton against mr devonshire and shook some of the contents of the stomach into the body i thought a joke was passing among them and said don't do that my lord campbell might not palmer have been impelled by some one outside him there was no one who could have impelled him what did you observe palmer do i saw mr newton and mr devonshire pushed together and palmer was over them he was smiling at the time examination continued after this interruption the opening of the stomach was pursued the stomach contained about three ounces of a brownish fluid there was nothing particular in that palmer was looking on and said they won't hang us yet he said that to mr bamford in a loud whisper that remark was made upon his own observation of the stomach the stomach after being emptied was put into the jar the intestines were then examined but nothing particular was found in them they were contracted and very small the viscera with their contents as taken from the body were placed in the jar which was then covered over with two bladders which were tied and sealed i tied and sealed them after i had done so i placed the jar upon the table by the body palmer was then moving about the room in a few minutes i missed the jar from where i had placed it during that time my attention had been withdrawn by the examination on missing the jar i called out where's the jar and palmer from the other end of the room said it is here i thought it would be more convenient for you to take away there was a door at the end of the room where he was he was within a yard or two of that door and about twenty-four feet from the table on which the body was lying before making this last statement the witness referred to a plan of the room which was put in by the attorney-general the door near which palmer was standing was not the one by which he had entered the room i called to palmer will you bring it here i went from the table and met palmer half-way coming with the jar the jar had since i last saw it been cut through both bladders the cut was hardly an inch long it had been done with a sharp instrument i examined the cut the edges were quite clean no part of the contents of the jar could have passed through finding this cut i said here is a cut who has done this palmer and mr devonshire and mr newton all said that they had not done it and nothing more was said about it when i was about to remove the jar from the room the prisoner asked me what i was going to do with it i said i should take it to mr frears he said i had rather you would take it to stafford than take it there i made no answer that i remember i took it to mr frears house after doing so i returned to the talbot arms i left the jar in mr frears hall tied and sealed immediately upon finding the slit in the cover i cut the strings and altered the bladders so that the slits were not over the top of the jar i resealed them after going to mr frears i went to the talbot arms i went into the yard to order my carriage and while i was waiting for it the prisoner came across to me he asked me what i had done with the jar 
I told him that I had left it at Mr. Frere's. He inquired what would be done with it, and I said it would go either to Birmingham or London that night for examination. I do not recollect that he made any reply. When I recovered the jar, I tied each cover separately and sealed it with my own seal. During the first post-mortem examination, there were several Rugeley persons present, but I believe no one on behalf of the prisoner. At the second examination, there was someone there on behalf of Palmer. Cross-examined by Mr. Sergeant Shee. In the course of the post-mortem examination, Palmer said, They won't hang us yet. I am not sure whether that observation was addressed to Dr. Bamford, or whether he prefaced it by the word, Doctor. I think that he first said it to Dr. Bamford in a loud whisper, and afterwards repeated it to several persons. I had said to him that I had heard that there was a suspicion of poisoning. I made notes in pencil at the time of the post-mortem, and I wrote a more formal report from those notes as soon as I got home. The original pencil notes are destroyed. I sent the fair copy to Mr. Stevens, Cook's father-in-law, the same evening. They were not produced before the coroner. At the base of the tongue of the deceased, I observed some enlarged mucus follicles. They were not pustules containing matter, but enlarged mucus follicles of long standing. There were a good many of them, but I do not suppose that they would occasion much inconvenience. They might cause some degree of pain, but I think that it would be slight. I do not believe that they were enlarged glands. I should not say that deceased's lungs were diseased, though they were not in their normal state. The lungs were full of blood and the heart empty. I had no lens at the post-mortem, but I made an examination which was satisfactory to me without one. The brain was carefully taken out. The membranes and external parts were first examined, and thin slices of about a quarter of an inch in thickness were taken off and subjected to separate examination. I think by that means we should have discovered disease if any had existed and if there had been any indication of disease, I should have examined it more carefully. I examined the spinal cord as far down as possible, and if there had been any appearance of disease, I should have opened the canal. There was no appearance of disease, however. We opened down to the first vertebra. If we had found a softening of the spinal cord, I do not think that it would have been sufficient to have caused Cook's death. Certainly not. A softening of the spinal cord would not produce tetanus. It might produce paralysis. I do not think, as a medical man investigating the cause of death, that it was necessary carefully to examine the spinal cord. I do not know who suggested that there should be an examination of the spinal cord two months after death. There were some appearances of decomposition when we examined the spinal cord, but I do not think that there was sufficient to interfere with our examination. I examined the body to ascertain if there was any trace of venereal disease. I did find certain indications of that description, and the marks of old excoriation, which were cicatrized over, re-examined by the Attorney General. There were no indications of wounds or sores, such as could by possibility produce tetanus. There was no disease of the lungs to account for death. The heart was healthy and its emptiness I attribute to spasmodic action. The heart being empty, of course death ensued. The convulsive spasmodic action of the muscles of the body, which was deposed to yesterday by Mr. Jones, would, in my judgment, occasion the emptiness of the heart. There was nothing whatever in the brain to indicate the presence of any disease of any sort, but if there had been, I never heard or read of any disease of the brain ever producing tetanus there was no relaxation of the spinal cord which would account for the symptoms accompanying Mr. Cook's death, as they have been described. In fact, there was no relaxation of the spinal cord at all, and there is no disease of the spinal cord with which I am acquainted that would produce tetanus. End of section 5 Section 6 of The Most Extraordinary Trial of William Palmer by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson.
third day may the sixteenth part two mr charles james devonshire undergraduate of university of london late assistant to dr monckton examined by mr huddleston i made the first post-mortem examination of the body of mr cook in november last the body was pale and stiff the hands were clinched and the mouth was contorted i opened the body the liver was very healthy the heart also seemed healthy but it was perfectly empty the lungs contained a considerable quantity of dark fluid blood the blood was perfectly fluid the brain was healthy throughout i examined the medulla oblongata and about a quarter or half an inch of the spinal cord it was perfectly sound i took out the stomach and opened it with a pair of scissors i put the contents in a jar which was taken to mr frears the surgeon i opened the jar from mr frears on monday in the same state as it was before and i gave it mr boycott clerk to mr gardiner the attorney i examined the body again on the twenty ninth and took out the liver kidneys spleen and some blood and put them in a stone jar which i covered with wash leather and brown paper and sealed up i delivered that jar also to boycott palmer said at the examination that we should find syphilis upon the deceased i therefore examined the parts carefully and found no indications of the sort i also took out the throat the papillae were slightly enlarged but they were natural and one of the tonsils was shrunk cross-examined by mr grove q c tetanic convulsions are considered to proceed from derangement of the spine and from complaints that affect the spine these derangements are not always capable of being detected by examination in examining the body of a person supposed to have died from tetanus the spinal cord would be the first organ looked at about half an inch of the spinal cord exterior to the aperture of the cranium was examined on the first occasion i was not present when the granules were discovered on the second examination the learned counsel was proceeding to cross-examine this witness upon some minute points of a scientific nature when baron alderson interposing said when you have all the medical men in london here you had better not examine an undergraduate of the university of london upon such points i should think dr monckton examined by the attorney-general i am a physician in practice and reside at rugeley on the twenty eighth of january i made a post-mortem examination of the spinal cord and marrow of the deceased j p cook i found the muscles of the trunk in a state of laxity which i should attribute to the decay of the body which had set in but that laxity would not be at all inconsistent in my opinion with a great rigidity of those muscles at the time of death the muscles of the arms and legs were in a state of rigidity but they were not more rigid than usual in dead bodies the muscles of the arms had partially flexed the fingers of the hand the feet were turned inwards to a much greater extent than usual i carefully examined the spinal cord the body was then in such a condition as to enable me to make a satisfactory examination of it and if prior to death there had been any disease of a normal character on the spinal cord and marrow i should have had no difficulty in detecting it there was no disease i discovered certain granules upon it it is difficult to account for their origin but they are frequently found in persons of advanced age i never knew them to occasion sudden death i agree entirely with the evidence which has been given by dr harland this witness was not cross-examined mr john boycott examined by mr wellsby i am clerk to mrs lander gardner and lander attorneys at rugeley on the twenty sixth of last november i received a jar from mr devonshire covered with leather and brown paper and sealed up i took it to london and delivered it on the next day to dr taylor at guy's hospital on a subsequent day i received another jar similarly secured from mr devonshire and i also brought that to london and delivered it to dr taylor i was not present at the inquest on cook's body and did not fetch newton to be examined there on tuesday last when at the rugeley station previous to my departure for london newton came and made a communication to me he knew that mr gardiner was not there 
and when we reached london i took him to mr gardiner and heard him make the same communication to mr gardiner which he had made before to me this witness was not cross-examined james myatt examined by mr james in november last i was postboy at the talbot arms at rugeley i know palmer the prisoner and i remember monday the twenty sixth of november last i was ordered on that night a little after five o'clock to take mr stevens to the stafford station in a fly before i started i went home to get my tea and on returning from my tea to the talbot arms i met the prisoner he asked me if i was going to drive mr stevens to stafford i told him i was what did he say to you then he asked me if i would upset them them had anything been said about a jar he said he supposed i was going to take the jar what did you say then i said i believed i was what did he say after that he said do you think you could upset them what answer did you make i told him no did he say anything more he said if you could there's a ten pound note for you sensation what did you say to that i told him i could not i then said i must go the horses are in the fly ready for us to start i do not recollect that he said anything more about the jar i said that if i didn't go somebody else would go he told me not to be in a hurry for if anybody else went he would pay me i saw him again next morning when i was going to breakfast he asked me then who went with the fly i told him mr stevens and i believed one of mr gardiner's clerks cross-examined by mr sergeant she were not the words that palmer used i wouldn't mind giving ten pounds to break stevens's neck i don't recollect the words break his neck well upset him did he say i wouldn't mind giving ten pounds to upset him yes i believe those were the words i do not know that palmer appeared to have been drinking i don't recollect that he had i can't say that he used any epithet applied to stevens he said it was a humbugging concern altogether or something of that i don't recollect that he said stevens was a troublesome fellow and very inquisitive i don't remember anything more than i have said i do not know whether there was more than one jar samuel cheshire formerly postmaster at rugeley who has been sentenced to two years imprisonment for tampering with letters in connection with this affair was brought up in custody and examined by mr james he is an extremely respectable looking man above the middle age and was dressed in black he deposed as follows i was for upward of eight years postmaster at rugeley i come now from newgate where i am under sentence for having read a letter the question was opened a letter i confessed to having done so the question was did you plead guilty to that charge i knew the prisoner william palmer very well we were schoolfellows together and i have been three or four times in my life at races with him i never made a bet but once in my life but i was very intimate with palmer i accompanied him to shrewsbury races in november eighteen fifty five i returned to rugeley on tuesday the thirteenth the same day on which polestar won the handicap on saturday the seventeenth i went to see mr cook who was in bed at the talbot arms at rugeley i lived at the post office which was three hundred or four hundred yards from palmer's house on the tuesday evening the twentieth i received a message from palmer asking me to go over to him and to take a receipt stamp with me in consequence of that message i went to palmer's house and took a receipt stamp as requested when i reached palmer's i found him in the sitting-room he said that he wanted me to write out a cheque and he produced a copy from which he said i was to write i copied the document which he produced he said that it related to money which mr cook owed him and he asked me to write it because he said cook was too ill to do it and weatherby would know his palmer's handwriting he said that when i had written it he would take it over to mr cook to sign i then wrote as he requested me and i left the paper with palmer mr weatherby was here called in order to trace this document in answer to mr james he said i am secretary to the jockey club and my establishment is at birmingham 
I keep a sort of banking account and receive stakes for gentlemen who own racers and bet. I knew the deceased, John Parsons Cook, who had an account of that nature with me. I knew Palmer slightly. He had no such account with me. On the 21st of November, I received a cheque or order upon our house for £350. It came by post. I sent it back two days afterwards, on Friday the 23rd. I sent it back by post to Palmer, the prisoner, at Rugeley. Boycott was recalled, and proved that he had served notices upon the prisoner, and upon Mr. Smith, his attorney, to produce the cheque or order referred to, and that it had not been produced in pursuance of these notices. Prisoner's counsel did not now produce it. Examination of Samuel Cheshire continued. As far as I can remember, what I wrote was, pay to Mr. William Palmer the sum of £350 and place it to my account. I do not remember whether I put any date to it. I left it with Palmer and went away. That was on Tuesday. On the Thursday or Friday following, Palmer sent again for me. I do not remember what day it was, but it was after I had heard of the death of Mr. Cook at the Talbot Arms. I went to Palmer in the evening, between six and seven o'clock, in consequence of his having sent for me. When I arrived, I found him in the kitchen, and he immediately went out, and shortly after returned with a quarto sheet of paper in his hand. He gave me a pen and asked me to sign something. I asked what it was, and he replied, You know that Cook and I have dealings together, and this is a document which he gave me some days ago, and I want you to witness it. I said, what is it about? He said, some business that I have joined him in, and which was all for Mr. Cook's benefit, and this is the document stating so. I just cast my eye over the paper. It was a quarto post paper of a yellow description. I looked at the writing, and I believed that it was Mr. Palmer's. When he asked me to sign it, I told him that I could not, as I might perhaps be called upon to give evidence on the matter at some future day. I told him that I had not seen Mr. Cook sign it, and I also said that I thought the post office authorities would not approve my mixing myself up in a matter which might occasion my absence from my duties to give evidence. In fact, I did not give any exact reasons for refusing to sign it. Palmer said it did not much matter, as he dared say they would not object to Mr. Cook's signature. I left the paper with Palmer and went away. I believed there was a stamp upon it. I did not read it all, but I cast my eye down it. Notices had also been served upon the prisoner and his attorney to produce this document, but it had not been produced. Witness continued. I remember the effect of it. It was that certain bills, the dates and amounts of which were quoted, although I cannot recollect them now, were all for Mr. Cook's benefit and not for Mr. Palmer's. Those were not the exact words, but that was the purport of them. I know that the amounts were large, although I do not remember them all. I remember, however, that one was for £1,000 and another for £500. There was a signature to that document. It was either I.P. or J.P. Cook. I don't think the word Parsons was written, but either I.P. or J.P. Cook. Palmer was in the habit of calling at the post office, for letters addressed to his mother, who resided at Rugeley. I cannot remember that during the months of October and November 1855 I gave him any letters addressed to his mother, nor can I say whether in those months I gave him any letters addressed to Mr. Cook, but Cook has taken Palmer's letters, and Palmer has taken Cook's letters. I remember the inquest upon Cook. I saw Palmer frequently while that inquest was going on. He came down to me on the Sunday evening previous to the 5th of December, the date to which the inquest was adjourned, and asked me if I saw or heard of anything fresh to let him know. I guessed what he wanted, and thought that he wanted to tempt me to open a letter. I therefore told him that I could not open a letter. He said that he did not want me to do anything to injure myself. I believe that was all that passed on that occasion. The letter for reading, which I am now under sentence of punishment, was from Dr. Alfred Taylor of London, to Mr. Gardner, the solicitor of Rugeley. I read part of the letter, 
and told Mr. Palmer as much as I remembered of it. This took place on the morning of the 5th of December. I told Palmer that the letter mentioned that no traces of strychnine were to be found. I can't call to mind what else I told him. He said he knew there would be no traces of poison, for he was perfectly innocent. The letter I hold in hand, signed W.P., and addressed to W. Ward Esquire, coroner, I believe to be in the prisoner's handwriting. Captain Hatton, examined by Mr. James. I am Chief Constable of Stafford. The letter now produced I obtained from the coroner. The clerk of arraigns read the letter in question. It bore no date, and was to the following effect. Quote, my dear sir, I am sorry to tell you that I am still confined to my bed. I don't think it was mentioned at the inquest yesterday that Cook was taken ill on Sunday and Monday night, in the same way as he was on the Tuesday when he died. The chambermaid at the Crown Hotel, Masters, can prove this. I also believe that a man by the name of Fisher is coming down to prove he received some money at Shrewsbury. Now here he could only pay Smith ten pounds out of forty-one pounds he owed him. Had you not better call Smith to prove this? And again, whatever Professor Taylor may say tomorrow, he wrote from London last Tuesday night to Gardner to say, We, and Dr. Rees, have this day finished our analysis and find no traces of either strychnia, prussic acid, or opium. What can beat this from a man like Taylor, if he says what he has already said, and Dr. Harlan's evidence? Mind you, I know, and saw it in black and white, what Taylor said to Gardner, but this is strictly private and confidential. But it is true. As regards his betting book, I know nothing of it, and it is of no good to any one. I hope the verdict to-morrow will be that he died of natural causes, and thus end it. Ever yours, W.P. The witness Cheshire was then cross-examined by Mr. Sergeant Shee. I knew Cook very well. I did not know his handwriting. I have seen it, but am not sufficiently familiar with it to be able to identify it. I have seen him write. When I refused to sign the document which Palmer presented to me for signature, he observed, Oh, it is no matter. I dare say they will not call in question Mr. Cook's signature. What Palmer asked me was whether I had seen or heard anything. I said that I had seen something, but that it would be wrong for me to tell him what. He then inquired what I had seen. I think the phrase he used in speaking of his own innocence was that he was as innocent as a baby. I remember having been told by Palmer the Saturday before Cook died that the latter was very ill. On that day I saw Cook. He was ill and in bed. I saw Palmer about midday of Wednesday, the second day of the Shrewsbury races. I saw him at Rugeley on that day. To Mr. James. The duration of the journey from Stafford to Shrewsbury is upwards of an hour. Ellis Crisp, examined by Mr. James. I am Inspector of Police at Rugeley. On the 17th of December I assisted in searching the prisoner's house. There was a sale of his furniture, etc., on the 5th of January. The book now produced I found in his house, and took it away. It was being sold, and I took it away. A laugh. Cross-examined by Mr. Sergeant Shee. It was brought out at the sale, with a lot of other books. There were several medical books in the house. There was no attempt to conceal the volume I seized. The clerk of arraigns read from the book referred to this sentence, proved by the witness boycott, to be in Palmer's writing. Strychnia kills by causing tetanic fixing of the respiratory muscles. J. Burden, examined by Mr. James. This manuscript book I found in the prisoner's house on the 16th or 17th of December. I am an inspector of police in Staffordshire. The Attorney General read an extract from the book in question. It related to strychnine and alluded to the mode of its operation. Lord Campbell. That may be merely a passage extracted from an article on strychnine in some encyclopedia. The Attorney General. No doubt it may. I put it in for what it is worth. Elizabeth Hawkes, examined by Mr. Huddleston. I keep a boarding-house at seven Beaufort Buildings, Strand. I know Palmer. 
he was at my house on the first december last he asked my porter to buy some game and fish for him i purchased some fowls for him on the first of december they consisted of a turkey and a brace of pheasants the porter purchased the fish i packed these things up in a hamper i had no conversation with palmer about these things i bought them by palmer's orders conveyed through the porter i sent them somewhere i directed them myself and gave them to the porter who carried them to the railway station i have never been paid for them palmer came to my house on the evening of that day but i did not see him the direction on the hamper was w w ward esq stoke upon trent staffordshire george herring examined by mr wellsby i live near new cross and am independent i knew cook and met him at the shrewsbury races last november i put up at the raven he appeared in his usual health i saw him between six and seven on wednesday the second day of the races i had a private room with mr fisher mr reed and mr t jones it was the next room occupied by cook and palmer on thursday the following day i saw cook i do not know that at that time he had any money with him but i saw him with bank of england and provincial bank notes on wednesday he unfolded them on his knees in twos and threes there was a considerable number of notes he showed me at shrewsbury his betting book it contained entries of bets made on the shrewsbury races on monday the nineteenth of november i received a letter from palmer i have it here the clerk of arraigns read the letter of which the following is a copy dear sir i shall feel much obliged if you will give me a call at seven beaufort buildings strand on monday about half past two i am dear sir very truly yours w palmer examination continued i received this letter on monday and called at beaufort buildings that same day at half past two exactly i found palmer there he asked me what i would take i declined to take anything i then asked him how mr cook was he said he's all right his physician gave him a dose of calomel and advised him not to come out it being a damp day i don't know which term he used damp or wet he then went on to say in the same sentence what i want to see you about is settling his account while he was speaking he took out half a sheet of note-paper from his pocket and it was open when he had finished the sentence he held it up and said this is it i rose to take it he said you had better take its contents down this will be a check against you at the same time he pointed to some paper lying on the table i wrote on that paper from his dictation i have here the paper which i so wrote the witness read the document in question which contained instructions as to certain payments he should pay out of monies to be received by him at tattersall's on account of the shrewsbury races palmer then said that i had better write out a cheque for pratt and padwick for the former four hundred and fifty pounds and for the latter three hundred and fifty pounds and send them at once i told him i had only one form of cheque in my pocket he said i could easily fill up a draft on half a sheet of paper i refused to comply with his request as i had not as yet received the money he replied that it would be all right for that cook would not deceive me he wished me particularly to pay mr pratt the four hundred and fifty pounds his words as nearly as i can remember them were you must pay pratt as it is for a bill of sale on the mare i don't know whether he said a bill of sale or a joint bill of sale he told me he was going to see both pratt and padwick to tell them that i would send on the money previous to his saying this i told him that if he would give me the address of pratt and padwick i would call on them after i had got the money from tattersall's and give it to them he then asked me what was between us there was only a few pounds between us and after we had had some conversation on the point he took out of his pocket a fifty pound bank of england note he required twenty nine pounds out of the note and i was not able to give it but he said that if i gave him a cheque it would answer as well i gave him a cheque for twenty pounds and nine sovereigns when i was going away i do not remember that he said anything about my paying the money to pratt and padwick 
he said on parting when you have settled this account write down the word to either me or cook i turned round and said i shall certainly write to mr cook i said so because i thought i was settling mr cook's account he said it don't much matter which you write to i said if i address mr cook rugely stafford it will be correct will it not he said yes and after leaving beaufort buildings i went to tassassel's i then received all the money i expected except one hundred and ten pounds from mr morris who paid me ninety pounds instead of two hundred pounds i sent from tattersall's a cheque for four hundred and fifty pounds to mr pratt i posted a letter to cook from tattersall's and directed it to rugeley on tuesday the twentieth next day i received a telegraphic message i have not got it here i gave it to captain hatton at the coroner's inquest at rugeley in consequence of receiving that message i wrote again to cook that day i addressed my letter as before but i believe the letter was not posted till the wednesday i had three bills of exchange with me i know palmer's handwriting but never saw him write i cannot prove his writing but i knew cook's writing and i believe the drawing of two and the accepting of the three bills to be in his writing i got them from fisher and gave him cash for them the witness boycott was recalled and identified the signatures on the bills as those of palmer and cook examination continued the bills are each for two hundred pounds one of them was payable in a month and when it fell due on october the eighteenth cook paid the one hundred pounds on account he paid me the remaining one hundred pounds at shrewsbury but i cannot tell with certainty on what day i did not pay the three hundred and fifty pounds to mr padwick i hold another bill for five hundred pounds thomas strawbridge manager of the bank at rugeley identified the drawing and endorsing as in the handwriting of palmer the acceptance purporting to be in the writing of mrs sarah palmer he did not believe to have been written by her examination continued i am sure that the endorsement on the five hundred pound bill is in cook's writing i got the bill from mr fisher i paid two hundred pounds on account of it to palmer and two hundred and seventy five pounds to mr fisher the balance was discount it was not paid at maturity i have taken proceedings against palmer to recover the amount cross-examined by mr grove several people were ill at shrewsbury on the second day of the races they suffered from a kind of diarrhoea i was one of those so affected i had my meals at the raven where i put up as also had my companions they were not ill but a gentleman who dined with us one day at the inn was palmer did not dine with me any day at the raven i saw cook several times on the race-course the ground was wet i remonstrated with him on thursday for standing on it that was after he had been taken ill on wednesday i was with palmer for about an hour at beaufort buildings frederick slack examined by mr huddleston i am the porter at mrs hawkes's boarding-house at beaufort buildings on the first of december i saw palmer there and he gave me the direction to put on a hamper containing game it was w w ward esq stoke upon trent staffordshire he told me to buy a turkey a brace of pheasants a codfish and a barrel of oysters and to put them wherever i pleased he said he did not wish the gentleman for whom they were intended to know from whom they came i saw him write the direction in the coffee-room i got the hamper and put all the things in it i sewed it up and took it to the railway mrs hawkes bought the fowl and i the other articles it being now within five minutes of six o'clock the court intimated its intention not to proceed further with the case that evening lord campbell suggested that some facility of breathing fresh air should be afforded to the jury before the sitting of the court on the following morning were it not that he made it a practice to take a walk early in the morning in kensington gardens he should himself find it impossible to endure the fatigue of so arduous a trial an omnibus or a couple of them ought to be engaged for the accommodation of the jury that they too might enjoy similar recreation mr baron alderson why should they not take a walk in the temple gardens there could be no more tranquil spot a laugh the sheriffs intimated that they would attend to the recommendations of the learned judges 
The court then adjourned at six o'clock until ten o'clock Monday. End of section six. Section seven of the most extraordinary trial of William Palmer by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Fourth day, May the seventeenth. The court was densely crowded, and there was no abatement of the interest which has from the commencement been excited by these proceedings. Among the distinguished persons present were Earl Grey and Mr. Dallas, the American minister. The jury, who, in accordance with the suggestions made by the learned judges on the previous day, had, during the morning, been conducted to the Middle Temple Gardens by the officer who had them in charge, and allowed to walk there for some time, entered the court about ten o'clock, and almost immediately afterwards the learned judges, Lord Chief Justice Campbell, Mr. Baron Alderson, and Mr. Justice Cresswell, accompanied by the recorder, the common sergeant, the sheriffs and under-sheriffs, and several members of the court of aldermen, took their seats upon the bench. The prisoner was then placed at the bar. There was no change in the expression of his countenance, and during the day he maintained his usual tranquillity of demeanour. The same counsel were again in attendance. The Attorney General, Mr. E. James, Q.C., Mr. Bodkin, Mr. Wellsby, and Mr. Huddleston for the Crown, Mr. Sergeant Shee, Mr. Grove, Q.C., Mr. Gray, and Mr. Keneally for the prisoner. George Bates, examined by Mr. James. I was brought up a farmer, but am now out of business. I have known Palmer eight or nine years. In September, October, and November last, I looked after his stud, and saw that the boys who had the care of the horses did their duty. I had no fixed salary, but used to receive money occasionally. Some weeks I received two sovereigns, and some only one. I lodged in Rugeley. The rent I paid was six shillings and sixpence per week. I am a single man. I knew the deceased cook. I have no doubt that I saw him at Palmer's house in September. I cannot fix the date. I dined with him at Palmer's. By Lord Campbell. I sat at table with them. Examination continued. After dinner, something was said of an insurance of my life. Either Cook or Palmer, which I cannot say, commenced the conversation. Mr. Sergeant Shee objected to the reception of any evidence with regard to the proposal of the insurance of the witness's life. The Attorney General said that his object was to show the position of Cook's affairs at this time. Lord Campbell, after consultation with the other judges, said, I doubted whether this would be relevant and proper evidence to receive upon this trial, and upon consultation the other judges agree with me that it is too remote. The examination of the witness with regard to the insurance was, therefore, not pursued. Witness I remember the death of Cook and the inquest. I know Mr. William Webb Ward, the coroner. On the morning of the 8th of December, while the inquest was being held, I saw Palmer. He gave me this letter and told me to go to Stafford and give it to Mr. Ward. The letter referred to was that addressed to Mr. Ward, which was on the previous day put in and read. That was between 9 and 10 o'clock. He also gave me a letter to a man named France, a dealer in game at Stafford. Palmer said that there would be a package of game from France, which I was to direct and send to Mr. Ward. I got a basket of game from France upon the order which the prisoner had given me. I directed it, Webb Ward, coroner or solicitor, Stafford, and sent it to Mr. Ward. I directed it myself. I gave a man threepence to take the game but i delivered the note to mr ward myself i found him at the dolphin inn stafford he was in the smoking room i told him i wanted to speak to him he called me out into the yard or passage and there i gave him the note there were other people in the smoking room 
I had had no directions from the prisoner as to how I was to deliver the note. When I returned to Rugeley that night, I saw the prisoner. I told him that I had delivered the letters which I took to Stafford, and had sent a boy with the game. I remember Thursday, the 13th of December. On that day, I was sent for to the prisoner's house early in the morning. About midday, I went to Palmer's house. I found him in bed. He said that he wanted me to go to Stafford, to take Webb Ward a letter, and to take care that no one saw me give it to him. On the Saturday previously, I had taken Palmer some money. On the Thursday, Palmer told me to go to Ben, and tell him he wanted a five-pound note. I understood Ben to be Mr. Thirlby, his assistant. Palmer added, tell him that I have no small change. I believe he asked me to look in a drawer under the dressing-glass, and said, tell me the amount of that bill. I looked in the drawer, and found there a fifty-pound Bank of England bill. I left the bill there. This was before he gave me the letter for Ward. After seeing the bill, I went to Thirlby's for the five pounds. I got from Thirlby a five-pound note of a local bank, and took it to Palmer. I then went downstairs, leaving Palmer in bed, with the writing materials on the bottom of it. I remained downstairs, in the yard or kitchens, about half an hour. When I went upstairs, Palmer again asked me the amount of the bill which was in the drawer. I just looked at it, and thought it was the same bill I had left there. He then gave me the letter, which was sealed, and I took it to Stafford. I followed Mr. Ward through the room at the railway station, and gave it to him in the road. Mr. Ward did not open or read the letter, but crumpled it up in his hand and put it into his pocket. I believe I told him from whom I had brought it. Having delivered the letter, I returned to Rugeley. I saw the prisoner, and told him that I had given Ward the letter. He said nothing. Cross-examined by Mr. Sergeant Shee. Palmer had four broodmares, and four yearlings, and a three-year-old. I can't tell their value. I heard that one of these horses sold for eight hundred guineas. I can't say whether the mares were in foal in November, but I suppose some were. Palmer's stables were at the back of his house, and the paddocks which were near them covered about twenty acres of ground, and were fenced with a hawthorn hedge. I remember a mare, called the Duchess of Kent, being there. We supposed she slipped her foal, but we could not find it. I am not aware that Goldfinder's dam slipped her foal. I once saw the turf cut up with horses' feet, and attributed it to the mares galloping about. I never saw any dogs run them. I have seen a gun at the paddocks. I cannot say whether it belonged to Palmer. I never examined it. I do not know Inspector Field by sight. I have seen a person whom I was told was Field. He came to me at the latter end of September, or beginning of October or November. I cannot say whether he saw Palmer. He was a stranger to me. I do not know that he put up anywhere. A laugh. I did not see him more than once. I do not know Field. On Thursday, December the 13th, I saw Gillett, who is a sheriff's officer, in Palmer's yard. Re-examined by the Attorney General. It was after the hay harvest that I saw the turf in the paddock cut up. I should say that it was in the latter end of September. I cannot say how long it was before Cook's death. Thomas Blizzard Curley examined by the attorney general i am a member of the college of surgeons and surgeon to the london hospital i have particularly turned my attention to the subject of tetanus and have published a work upon that subject tetanus means a spasmodic affection of the voluntary muscles of true tetanus there are only two descriptions idiopathic and traumatic there are other diseases in which we see contractions of the muscles, but we should not call them tetanus. Idiopathic tetanus is apparently self-generated. Traumatic proceeds from a wound or sore. Idiopathic tetanus arises from exposure to damp or cold, or from the irritation of worms in the alimentary canal. It is not a disease of frequent occurrence. I have never seen a case of idiopathic tetanus although I have been surgeon to the London Hospital for 22 years. 
Cases of traumatic tetanus are much more frequent. Speaking quite within compass, I have seen 50 such cases. I believe 100 will be nearer the mark. The disease first manifests itself by stiffness about the jaws and back of the neck. Rigidity of the muscles of the abdomen afterwards sets in. A dragging pain at the pit of the stomach is an almost constant attendant. In many instances, the muscles of the back are extensively affected. These symptoms, though continuous, are liable to aggravations into paroxysms. As the disease goes on, these paroxysms become more frequent and severe. When they occur, the body is drawn backwards. In some instances, though less frequently, it is bent forwards. A difficulty in swallowing is a very common symptom, and also a difficulty of breathing during the paroxysms. The disease may, if fatal, end in two ways. The patient may die somewhat suddenly from suffocation, owing to the closure of the opening of the windpipe or he may be worn out by the severe and painful spasms the muscles may relax and the patient gradually sink and die the disease is generally fatal the locking of the jaw is an almost constant symptom attending traumatic tetanus i may say a constant symptom it is not always strongly marked but generally so it is an early symptom another symptom is a peculiar expression of the countenance by lord campbell i believe this is not peculiar to traumatic tetanus but my observation is taken from such cases examination resumed there is a contraction of the eyelids a raising of the angles of the mouth and contraction of the brow in traumatic tetanus the lower extremities are sometimes affected and sometimes but somewhat rarely the upper ones when the muscles of the extremities are affected the time at which that occurs varies. If there is no wounds in the arms or legs, the extremities are generally not affected until late in the progress of the disease. I never knew or read of traumatic tetanus being produced by a sore throat or by a canker. In my opinion, a syphilitic sore would not produce tetanus. I know of no instance in which a syphilitic sore has led to tetanus. I think it a very unlikely cause. The time in which traumatic tetanus causes death varies from 24 hours to 3 or 4 days, or longer. The shortest period that ever came to my knowledge was 8 to 10 hours. The disease, when once commenced, is continuous. Did you ever know a case in which a man was attacked one day, had 24 hours respite, and was then attacked the next day? Never. I should say that such a case could not occur. You have heard the account given by Mr. Jones of the death of the deceased. Were the symptoms there consistent with any forms of traumatic tetanus that has ever come under your observation? No. What distinguishes it from such cases? The sudden onset of the disease. In all cases which have come under my notice, the disease was preceded by the milder symptoms of tetanus, gradually proceeding to the complete development. Were the symptoms described by the woman Mills as being presented on the Monday night those of tetanus? No, not of the tetanus of disease. Assuming tetanus to be synonymous with convulsive or spasmodic action of the muscles, was there in that sense tetanus on the Monday night? No doubt there was spasmodic action of the muscles. There was not, in your opinion, either idiopathic or traumatic tetanus? No. Why are you of that opinion? The sudden onset of the spasms and their rapid subsidence are consistent with neither of the two forms of tetanus. Is it not what is called hysteric tetanus? Yes, it is rather hysteria combined with spasms, but it is sometimes called hysteric tetanus. I have known no instance of its proving fatal or of its occurring to a man. Some poisons will produce tetanus. Nux vomica, acting through its poisons strychnia and brucia, poisons of a cognate character, produce that effect. I never saw a case of human life destroyed by strychnine. Cross-examined by Mr. Sergeant Shee. Irritation of the spinal cord or of the nerves proceeding to it might produce tetanus. 
do you agree with the opinion of dr webster in his lectures on the principles and practice of physic that in four cases out of five the disease begins with lockjaw i do do you agree with dr watson that all the symptoms of tetanic convulsions may arise from causes so slight as these the sticking of a fishbone in the forces the air caused by a musket shot the stroke of a whiplash under the eye leaving the skin unbroken the cutting of a corn the biting of the finger by a favourite sparrow the blow of a stick on the neck the insertion of a seton the extraction of a tooth the injection of a hydrocele and the operation of cutting excepting the percussion of the air from a musket ball i think all these causes may produce the symptoms referred to do you remember reading of a case which occurred in edinburgh in which a negro servant lacerated his thumb by the fracture of a china dish and was instantly while the guests were at dinner seized with tetanus the attorney-general interposing before the witness replied i have taken some pains to ascertain what this case is and where it is got from cross-examination continued could traumatic tetanus occur within so short a time as a quarter of an hour after the reception of an injury i know of no well-authenticated instance of the kind did you inquire into this case which is mentioned in your own treatise Quote, a negro having scratched his thumb with a piece of broken china was seized with tetanus and in a quarter of an hour after this he was dead End quote. i refer to authority as far as i could but i did not find any reference to it except encyclopedias when i wrote that book i was a young man twenty-two years of age i have maturer judgment and greater experience now you say that no case of idiopathic tetanus has come under your notice none i dare say you will tell us that such cases are not so likely to come to the hospital as those of a wound ending in traumatic tetanus they would be more likely in the first instance to come under the notice of a physician than that of a surgeon certainly by lord campbell i have read of cases of idiopathic tetanus in this country mr sergeant she we shall be able to show that there have been such cases cross-examination continued do you not know that very lately there was a case in the london hospital a case in which tetanus came on so rapidly and so unaccountably that it was referred to strychnine and it was thought necessary to examine the stomach of the patient i know that such an opinion was entertained before the history of the case was investigated i have heard that no strychnine was found in that case old syphilitic sores were discovered by lord campbell i did not see the patient who was under the care of the house surgeons who are now in court cross-examination continued might not the irritation of a syphilitic sore by wet cold drink mercury and mental excitement lead to tetanic symptoms i do not think that that is very likely the irritation which is likely to produce tetanus is the sore being exposed to friction to which syphilitic sores in the throat are not exposed i should class tetanus arising from the irritation of a sore as traumatic cases very rarely occur which it is difficult to class as either traumatic or idiopathic i should class tetanus arising from irritation of the intestines as idiopathic the character of the spasms of epilepsy is not tetanic but are not the contractions of epilepsy sometimes continuous so that the body may be twisted into various forms and remain rigidly in them not continuously for five or ten minutes together i think not does it not frequently happen that general convulsions no trace of which in the form of disease or lesion is to be found in the body after death occur in the most violent and spastic way so as to exhibit appearances of tetanic convulsions no instance of the kind has come under my observation do you agree with this opinion of dr copeland expressed in his dictionary of practical medicine under the head general convulsions Quote, 
the abnormal contraction of the muscles is in some cases of the most violent and spastic nature and frequently of some continuance the relaxations being of brief duration or scarcely observable and in others nearly or altogether approaching to tetanic i would rather speak from my own observation i have not observed anything of the kind does it not happen that a patient dies of convulsions spastic in the sense of their being tumultuous and alternating and chronic in the sense of exhibiting continuous rigidity yet after death no disease is found it does not often happen in adults does it sometimes i do not know nor have i read of such a case i have no hesitation in saying that people may die from tetanus and other diseases without the appearance of morbid symptoms after death are not the convulsions not strictly speaking tetanic constantly preserved by retching distension of the stomach flatulence of the stomach and bowels and other dyspeptic symptoms such cases do not come under my observation as a hospital surgeon i think it is very probable that general convulsions are accompanied by yelling i don't know that they frequently terminate fatally and that the proximate cause of death is spasm of the respiratory muscles inducing asphyxia re-examined by the attorney-general these convulsions are easily distinguished from tetanus because in them there is an entire loss of consciousness is it one of the characteristic features of tetanus that the consciousness is not affected it is dr todd examined by the attorney-general i am physician at king's college hospital and have held that office about twenty years i have also lectured on physiology and anatomy on tetanus and the diseases of the nervous system and have published my lectures i agree with the last witness in his distinction between idiopathic and traumatic tetanus i have seen two cases of what appeared to me to be idiopathic tetanus but such cases are rare in this country by lord campbell i define idiopathic tetanus to be that form of the disease which is produced without any external wound apparently from internal causes from a constitutional cause examination resumed in my opinion the term tetanus ought not to be applied to disease produced by poisons but i should call the symptoms tetanic in order to distinguish the character of the convulsions i have observed cases of traumatic tetanus except that in all such cases there is some lesion the symptoms are precisely the same as those of idiopathic tetanus the disease begins with stiffness about the jaw the symptoms gradually develop themselves and extend to the muscles of the trunk when the disease has begun is there any intermission there are remissions but they are not complete only diminutions of the severity of the symptoms not a total subsidence the patient does not express himself as completely well quite comfortable i speak from my own experience what is the usual period that elapses between the commencement and the termination of the disease the cases may be divided into two classes acute cases will terminate in three or four days chronic cases will go on as long as from nineteen to twenty-two or twenty-three days and perhaps longer i do not think that i have known a case in which death occurred within four days cases are reported in which it occurred in a shorter period in tetanus the extremities are affected but not so much as the trunk their affection is a late symptom the locking of the jaw is an early one sometimes the convulsions of epilepsy assume somewhat of a tetanic character but they are essentially distinct from tetanus in epilepsy the patient always loses consciousness apoplexy never produces tetanic convulsions perhaps i might be allowed to say that when there is effusion of blood upon the brain and a portion of the brain is involved the muscles may be thrown into short tetanic convulsions in such case the consciousness would be destroyed having heard described the symptoms attending the death of the deceased and the post-mortem examination i am of opinion that in this case there was neither apoplexy nor epilepsy the attorney-general said that as dr bamford was so unwell 
that it was doubtful whether he would be able to appear as a witness, he proposed to put in his deposition, in order to found upon it a question to the witness now under examination. Dr. Todd and Dr. Tweedy deposed that they had seen Dr. Bamford on the previous day, and that he was then suffering from a severe attack of English cholera. He was too unwell to be able to attend and give evidence. The court ruled that the depositions taken before the coroner might be read, and they were accordingly read by the clerk of arraigns. They were to the following effect. Quote, I attended the late Mr. Cook at the request of Mr. William Palmer. I first saw him about three o'clock on Saturday, the 17th of November, when he was suffering from violent vomiting, the stomach being in that irritable state that it would not contain a teaspoonful of milk. There was perfect moisture of the skin, and he was quite sensible. I prescribed medicine for him, and Mr. Palmer went up to my house and waited till I had made it up, and then took it away. I prescribed a saline medicine to be taken in an effervescent state. Between seven and eight o'clock in the evening, Mr. Palmer again requested me to visit Mr. Cook. The sickness still continued, everything being ejected which he took into his mouth. I gave him two pills as a slight opiate. Mr. Palmer took the pills from my house. I did not accompany him, nor do I know what became of the pills. On the following morning, Sunday, Mr. Palmer again called, and asked me to accompany him. Mr. Cook's sickness still continued. I remained about ten minutes. Everything he took that morning was ejected from his stomach. Everything he threw up was as clear as water, except some coffee which he had taken. Mr. Palmer had administered some pills before I saw Mr. Cook on Saturday, which had purged him several times. Between six and seven o'clock in the evening, I again visited the deceased, accompanied by Mr. Palmer. The sickness still continued. I went on Monday morning between eight and nine o'clock and changed his medicine. I sent him a draught which relieved him from the sickness and gave him ease. I did not see him again until Tuesday night when Mr. Palmer called for me. I examined Mr. Cook in the presence of Mr. Jones and Mr. Palmer, and I observed a change in him. He was irritable and troubled in mind. His pulse was firm but tremulous, and between eighty and ninety. He threw himself down on the bed and turned his face away. He said he would have no more pills nor take any more medicine. End quote. Quote, After they had left the room, Mr. Palmer asked me to make two more pills similar to those of the previous night, which I did, and he then asked me to write the directions on a slip of paper, and I gave the pills to Mr. Palmer. The effervescing mixture contained twenty grains of carbonate of potash, two drachms of compound tincture of cardamine, and two drachms of simple syrup, together with fifteen grains of tartaric acid for each powder. I never gave Mr. Cook a grain of antimony. I did not see the preparations after they were taken away by Mr. Palmer. Mr. Cook did not say he had taken the pills which he had prepared, but he expressed a wish on Sunday and Monday nights to have the pills. His skin was moist, and there was not the least fever about him. When I saw the deceased on Monday, he did not say that he had been ill on the Sunday night, but Mr. Palmer told me that he had been ill. I attended Mrs. Palmer some days before her decease, also two children, and a gentleman from London who was on a visit at Mr. Palmer's house, and who did not live many hours after I was called in. The whole of those patients died. Mr. Palmer first made an application to me for a certificate of Mr. Cook's death on the following Sunday morning, when I objected, saying, "'He is your patient.' I cannot remember his reply, but he wished me to fill up the certificate, and I did so. We had no conversation at that time as to the cause of death, nothing more than the opinion I have expressed. Mr. Palmer said he was of the same opinion as myself, with respect to the death of the deceased. I never knew apoplexy produced rigidity of the limbs. Drowsiness is the prelude to apoplexy. I attributed the sickness of the first two days to a disordered stomach. Mr. Cook never sent for me himself. End quote. The examination of Dr. Todd by the Attorney General was then proceeded with as follows. 
having heard the deposition of dr bamford read i do not believe that the deceased died from apoplexy or from epilepsy i never knew tetanus arise either from syphilitic sores or from sore throat there are poisons which will produce tetanic convulsions the principal of those poisons are nux vomica strychnine and bruchia i have never seen human life destroyed by strychnine but i have seen animals destroyed by it frequently the poison is usually given in a largish dose in those cases so as to put an end to the sufferings and destroy life as soon as possible i should not like to give a human subject a quarter of a grain i think that it is not unlikely that half a grain might destroy life and i believe that a grain certainly would i think that half a grain would kill a cat the symptoms which would ensue upon the administration of strychnine when given in solution and i believe that poisons of that nature act more rapidly in a state of solution than in any other form would develop themselves in ten minutes after it was taken if the dose were a large one if not so large they might be half an hour or an hour before they appeared those symptoms would be tetanic convulsions of the muscles more especially those of the spine and neck the head and back would be bent back and the trunk would be bowed in a marked manner the extremities also would be stiffened and jerked out the stiffness once set in would never entirely disappear but fresh paroxysms would set in and the jerking rigidity would reappear and death would probably ensue in a quarter of an hour or so the difference between tetanus produced by strychnine and other tetanus is very marked in the former case the duration of the symptoms is very short and instead of being continuous in their development they will subside if the dose has not been strong enough to produce death and will be renewed in fresh paroxysms whereas in other descriptions of tetanus the symptoms commence in a mild form and become stronger and more violent as the disease progresses the difficulty experienced in breathing is common alike to tetanus properly so called and to tetanic convulsions occasioned by strychnine arising from the pressure upon the respiratory muscles i think it is remarkable that the deceased was able to swallow and that there was no fixing of the jaw which would have been the case with tetanus proper resulting either from a wound or from disease from all the evidence i have heard i think that the symptoms which presented themselves in the case of mr cook arose from tetanus produced by strychnine cross-examined by mr grove q c there are cases sloping into each other as it were of every grade and degree from mild convulsions to violent tetanic spasms i have published some lectures upon diseases of the brain and i adhere to the opinion there expressed that the state of a person suffering from tetanus is identical with that which strychnine is capable of producing in a pathological point of view an examination of the spinal cord shortly after death in investigating supposed deaths from strychnine is important the signs of decomposition however could be easily distinguished from the evidences of disease which existed previously to death but it would be difficult to distinguish in such a case whether mere softening resulted from decomposition or from pre-existing disease there is nothing in the post-mortem examination which leads me to think that deceased died from tetanus proper i think that granules upon the spinal cord such as i have heard described would not be likely to cause tetanus i have not heard of cases treated by mr travers in animals to which strychnine has been administered i cannot say that i have observed what you call an intolerance of touch but by touching them the spasms are apt to be excited that sensibility to touch continues as long as the operation of the poison continues i have examined the interior of animals that have been killed by strychnine but i have not observed in such cases that the right side of the heart was usually full of blood it is some years since i made such an examination but i am able nevertheless to speak positively as to the state of the heart it was usually empty on both sides i do not agree with dr taylor or other authorities in the opinion that in cases of tetanus animals died asphyxiated if they did we should invariably have a right side of the heart full of blood which is not the case i think that the term asphyxiated 
or suffocated is often very loosely used i know from my reading that morphia sometimes produces convulsions but i believe that they would be of an epileptic character i think that the symptoms from morphia would be longer deferred in making their appearance than from strychnine but i cannot speak positively on the point morphia like strychnine is a vegetable poison i have not observed in animals the jaw fixed after the administration of strychnine re-examined by the attorney-general whatever may be the true theory as to the emptiness of the heart after strychnine i should say that the heart is more ordinarily empty than filled after tetanus i think that the heart would be more contracted after strychnine than in ordinary tetanus i do not believe that a medical practitioner would have any difficulty in distinguishing between ordinary convulsions and tetanic convulsions i have heard the evidence of the gentleman who made the post-mortem examination and i apprehend that there was nothing to prevent the discovery of disease in the spinal cord had any existed previously to death sir benjamin brodie examined by mr james q c i have been for many years senior surgeon to st george's hospital and have had considerable experience as a surgeon in the course of my practice i have had under my care many cases of death from tetanus death from idiopathic tetanus is according to my experience very rare in this country the ordinary tetanus in this country is traumatic tetanus i have heard the symptoms which accompanied the death of mr cook and i am of opinion that so far as there was a general contraction of the muscles they resembled those of traumatic tetanus but as to the course those symptoms took they were entirely different i have attended to the detailed description of the attack suffered by mr cook on the monday night its ceasing on tuesday and its renewal on tuesday night the symptoms of traumatic tetanus always begin so far as i have seen very gradually the stiffness of the lower jaw being i believe invariably the symptom first complained of at least so it has been in my experience the contraction of the muscles of the back is always a later symptom generally much later the muscles of the extremities are affected in a much less degree than those of the neck and trunk except in some cases where the injury has been in a limb and an early symptom has been spasmodic contraction of the muscles of that limb i do not myself recollect a case of ordinary tetanus in which occurred that contraction in the muscles of the hand which i understand was stated to have taken place in this instance again ordinary tetanus rarely runs its course in less than two or three days and often is protracted to a much longer period i knew only one case in which the disease was said to have terminated in so short a time as twelve hours but probably in that case the early symptoms had been overlooked again i never knew the symptoms of ordinary tetanus to last for a few minutes then subside and then come on again after twenty-four hours i think that these are the principal points of difference which i perceived between the symptoms of ordinary tetanus and those which i have heard described in this case i have not witnessed tetanic convulsions from strychnine on animal life i do not believe that death in the case of mr cook arose from what we ordinarily call tetanus either idiopathic or traumatic i never knew tetanus result from sore throat or from canker or from any other form of syphilitic disease the symptoms were not the result of apoplexy or of epilepsy perhaps i had better say at once that i never saw a case in which the symptoms that i have heard described here arose from any disease sensation when i say that of course i refer not to particular symptoms but to the general course which the symptoms took cross-examined by mr sergeant she i believe i remember one case in the physician's ward of st george's hospital which was shown to me as a case of idiopathic tetanus but i doubted whether it was tetanus at all it was a slight case and i do not remember the particulars considering how rare cases of tetanus are do you think that the description given by the chambermaid and a provincial medical man who had never seen but one case is sufficient to enable you to form an opinion as to the nature of the case i must say i thought that the description was very clearly given 
supposing that they differed in their description which would you rely on the medical man or the chambermaid baron alderson this is hardly a question to put to a medical witness although it may be a very proper observation for you to take cross-examination continued i never knew syphilitic poison produce tetanic convulsions except in cases where there was disease of the bones of the head sir benjamin brodie gave his evidence with great clearness slowly audibly and distinctly matters in which other medical witnesses would do well to emulate so distinguished an example End of section seven